uh, my name is uh, Sami. Um, so we want to start off uh, this program for this morning. I'm hoping that you've had a uh, hearty breakfast, or you'll continue to do so, uh, and that you'll feel uh, completely welcome. Um, and we are absolutely delighted uh, that you're able to make time with, uh, to be with us uh, this morning. All right. So I just want to briefly mention uh, about CDH, um, who we are and what we do. Um, so CDH is a short form of Cliff Decker Hofmeyer. Uh, it's a law firm that is based in South Africa. The head office is in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. It's one of the leading, largest, and best quality law firms uh, in Africa. It has offices in Cape Town, Stellenbosch, and now Nairobi. Uh, we partnered with CDH on April 1st of this year, and we wanted to bring the best quality of legal services uh, in Africa so that our clients within East Africa could enjoy the same quality of service and to also help us grow what was already an existing and well-established exceptional practice. So CDH is a law firm that has more than 168 years of heritage. It has more than 120 partners and more than 500 other employees. In the Nairobi office, we are five partners. Um, most of them are in this room today. And we also have about other um, 16 uh, members of staff. So still growing the business, and we also recently moved to a new office on Riverside Drive, um, Riverside Drive at Merchant Square. So that's where you can find us. That's our physical location. A much bigger office in a very, very good area. So what do we do at CDH? As I mentioned, we're a business law firm, and we operate in a variety of sectors. We're a full-service law firm, which means we provide businesses with a full range of services they need to operate. And the sectors in which we operate are numerous, including agriculture, business rescue and restructuring, employment, energy, uh, hospitality and leisure, dispute resolution, arbitration, um, telecommunications, as well as industrials, manufacturing and trade, which is the primary focus of today's uh, discussions. So we want to uh, you know, kick off this event. Um, I thought to mention my name last so that you could pay attention to what I say and have something at the back of your mind. Who is this person? Um, so my name is Sam Indolo. Uh, Sam Indolo. I'm the managing partner of the Nairobi office of Cliff Decker Hofmeyer. So absolutely delighted and happy to have you here. And uh, I'll, I think I'll invite Laurie to give some few remarks about the FCC and what they do. Thank you for joining us today. So, Sammy, I'll take a different approach and I will introduce myself first <laughs> to see if I still have your attention. So, my name is Laure Pogam and I'm the director of the French Chamber um, of Commerce in Kenya. Uh, I'll be very brief this morning. I just wanted to thank CDH um, and especially uh, Sammy, Shem, Anne and Jerry for reaching out to me um, to and for using this event in collaboration with the French Chamber. I think that this morning is a great example of what we are trying to do at the French Chamber, uh, which is fostering interactions and connections and collaborations between members. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for your support. Um, we are currently planning the launch of a Road to Market and Manufacturing Business Committee to encourage professionals in the same sector or from the same profession to interact and network, share experiences and good practices. Uh, so this event is a great first step for us. Um, I would like to thank our board members for participating in the panel discussion today. Thank you uh, to Frédéric Narasegain from Essilor, Anne-Marianne from Afribon, and Nicolas Guibert from Mobius. Um, 
Thanks for supporting this initiative. Uh, I think that's all for me. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the discussion. Merci de pratiquer mon français en tout cas. Um, et merci à vous et je, uh, on est très uh, ravis de vous avoir avec nous. Uh, merci à Frédéric, Anne et uh, Nicolas aussi. Um, what we're talking about today is industrialization. Um, we want to have a panel discussion. And to set the scene for us, I'm very delighted to have with me my partner, um, Jacqueline Ferris from the South Africa office, uh, and my partner, Desmond de Thiambo. So let, let me hand over to Jacqueline first, set the scene for us, and then we will do the introductions. Thank you, Njeri. Let me stand to set the scene. <laughs> I have a few notes. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Njeri mentioned, I'm Jacqueline Ferris, so I'm a partner at the South African office of CDH. Uh, and also the sector head for industrials, manufacturing and trade. So um, today's event, so you also see the title says Towards Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. So this is an agenda um, that is set by the African Union uh, through all the member states of the African Union saying that as Africa, we need to reindustrialize or industrialize in order to see much greater prosperity for the continent. That's the only way we can catapult millions of Africans out of poverty into the middle class and ensure sustainable economic growth. Now, today's topic is about rethinking industrialization. So, what do we mean by industrialization? And we've seen industrialization in various other forms. We talk about the fourth industrial revolution. We look at what's happening in Asia in terms of where they came from, in terms of from a manufacturing base, we've seen significant economic development in the Asian region, and specifically China. We've seen changes in the form of industrialization in other regions, um, whether it's in the Americas, whether it's in Europe, um, where we talk about electric mobility and we talk about uh, AI and the evolution of industries. So what do we mean uh, when we say that Africa needs to rethink industrialization? Now, as I mentioned, manufacturing um, has played a significant role in the industrialization of many economies. And it has been identified by various studies, whether the World Bank, whether the World Economic Forum, that for Africa to be successful, we need to start developing specific manufacturing nodes, creating regional value addition. And how does that happen? So the first steps in the process has been uh, what we call the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So most of you might have heard of this in the news or have read about it, and it's very laudable objectives. So it sets out objectives where 54 states in Africa has come together and signed a treaty establishing a free trade area. Now that free trade area is intended to integrate the economies and create a market where uh, traders who manufacture goods can access a market of almost 1.3 billion people. But it's, not, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, and we've seen this. So if you look at trade currently on the African continent in comparison with what happens either in Europe, intra-regional trade in Europe, intra-regional trade in the Americas or in Asia, that is significantly more than what we see on the, uh, in, in Africa. If you take the statistics for the past four years from 2017 or 2016 up until 2020 or 2019, the average trade, intra-Africa trade, I'm not talking about trade into the continent, but trade amongst the, the African countries is about 15%. That's very, very low. And one of the reasons again for that is that there is not a sufficient manufacturing capacity. So there's a need to invest in expanding the manufacturing capacity on the continent. And that's the opportunity ultimately that awaits a number of businesses on the continent in investing in manufacturing because the benefits that out, uh, the benefits of manufacturing on the continent gives you access to a free trade market. Essentially, no tariffs on your, on your goods, um, 
ease of customs, reduction of trade barriers with the technical, in terms of technical standards that are imposed by various uh, countries on the continent, um, other trade issues. So, so those are the benefits, but it's not easy because what we also have is we need to, as a continent, there needs to be uniformity in, in terms of industrial policies. How do we encourage regional integration through that? And one, one point maybe that I, before I hand over to my panelists, is also um, a point that has been made in a report that was released earlier this year uh, during the Davos um, W, the World Economic Forum. So the World Economic Forum Regional Action Group agenda in the initiative called the Great Reset Initiative said, specifically in respect of uh, the AFCFTA and what Africa needs to do and identifying manufacturing as critical. So they say there's no sector that creates jobs, deepens local value chains, encourages the growth of services economy, such as for lawyers, for accountants, and a number of other professionals, and embeds intellectual property quite like manufacturing. There's no other sector. Because what we have currently on the continent is we have a, a, an extractive sector, essentially where more raw materials use is extracted, and all of those, most of the raw materials are not beneficiated on the continent. It's exported to China. It, there's value addition in China. It's re-imported into the continent. So what we need to do is we need to re-industrialize, or we need not just re, we need to industrialize using resources, using intellect, and creating the legal framework the policy framework, the economic framework, not just between Kenya alone, but it's a regional initiative. So where you have various value chains developed within a region that can service the entire African continent. So, so that's important, and that's also what's recognized by the World Economic Forum. What they say is, having said that, that the report acknowledges that Af uh, for Africa building an industrial-driven economy does not come about through a simple policy shift. So it's, that doesn't mean that we now have the AFCFTA, that it's all fine. It means that there's a lot of structural work that needs to go into making sure that we actually can industrialize. And that is dealing with infrastructure issues because, as we all know, Africa has a chronic infrastructure problem in terms of roads, in terms of ports, in terms of railways. So if you don't deal with the infrastructural issues also, you can have the most wonderful framework, but it will not help. So, so, so that leads me into um, the next discussion, which is essentially the industry talking about their experience um, on the continent, in the region, in Kenya, in terms of what's happening, the bottlenecks, the issues, and what we need to do. Maybe the last parting words is also, so we still, would, we still as, as a continent, we're still suffering from, from COVID and the after effects of COVID, and we're still essentially in the pandemic. And we, last year, we actually also saw the supply chain issues that was experienced where whether we talk about PPE, whether we talk about vaccines, Africa stood last in the queue because, again, lo local manufacturing issues. So we need to start investing in local manufacturing using the benefits under the trade agreements and the policy shifts that governments will do to ensure that. So I hand now over to Njeri again. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Jacqueline, for that important discussion. And I think what, what I want to say is that um, the panelists that we have here are um, people who are practitioners and can give us insight on, on what they are experiencing themselves in um, their industries. And so let me just introduce them quickly. We have Frederick Naragusin. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Um, he's the general manager of Estelo, and he covers Kenya and Ethiopia. There's, it's important for us to have a regional dimension so that we can understand um, the nexus between operating in, in Kenya and then operating within the region. Okay, um, he's an optician by trade. Um, he was uh, the CEO of Optic Development, which is a company based in Reunion and the uh, Reunion Island. Um, he manages a group of 120 employees, so his experience is vast. And thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, and next we have um, Anne Marianne. 
Anne is a co-founder and managing director of Afribon. Afribon designs and manufactures taste solutions, mainly food flavors for food and beverage manufacturers. Um, the group has six operation sites, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Cameroon, and Nigeria. Um, you know, very broad um, experience in all of those jurisdictions, which we certainly can learn from. Um, Anne is a graduate of the ESCP Europe and has previously worked in China in the textile industry. Um, so again, a lot of experience there. And Nicholas is the Chief Executive Officer at Mobius and brings over 30 years experience in the automotive industry. Um, he worked for Jaguar Land Rover, Jaguar Plant Operations Director, and Global Manufacturing Transformation Director. He also worked at PSA Group, where he held multiple manufacturing roles within the group and led greenfield, brownfield projects across diverse countries, um, you know, globally, Argentina, Chile, Czech Republic, China. Um, I mean, I, I could go on. <laughs> Nicholas. Um, but Mobius is certainly a very interesting company because it's the only car manufacturer. Is it the only car manufacturer in Africa or in Kenya? Uh, depends how you see it. <laughs> Good answer. Thank you very much. And then obviously we have my partner Desmond Othiambo, um, who is a dispute resolution partner for us at CDH, and Jack Hall, who um, heads the um, industrials, manufacturing, and trade sector group for us in CDH, but is also a dispute resolution partner. So I want to start off with getting practical experience, practical knowledge from um, our panelists. So Frederick, would you like to kick off? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be uh, so I'm Frederick, uh, general manager of uh, Essilor Luxotica uh, for Kenya and, uh, and Ethiopia. So before speaking my uh, my experience on the ground, maybe I would like to introduce my uh, my industry. So uh, just uh, I think you know uh, you know Essilor uh, Essilor Luxotica in the world. Uh, we uh, we sell uh, we are an industry uh, of optical, uh, especially in uh, lenses, uh, frames, and instruments. Uh, so we cover uh, all the world. Uh, now we are based in Kenya uh, to cover the market of Kenya, and uh, we have uh, 20 uh, offices uh, in Africa. Uh, so we would like to, to expand our uh, our market in uh, in Africa. Uh, we uh, we do uh, uh, about uh, uh, 17 uh, billion uh, euro in the world. But uh, recently uh, we did uh, an acquisition, uh, uh, a retail acquisition, uh, 7,000 uh, stores in the world, and for uh, 7 billion euro. So now we, 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 are around, uh, we are around 25 uh, million euros. Uh, now I would inform my presentation, but it's okay, I can continue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, several uh, projects in, in Kenya. Uh, so here uh, I cover uh, Kenya, I cover uh, Ethiopia, and uh, I cover uh, also uh, Uganda and Tanzania. And uh, yes, perfect. <laughs> so yes, just uh, I introduce uh, my, my, my company, so it's a global design, design manufacturer and solution for so you can see and that's it, so you can just go ahead. Um, just before. So our, our mission uh, is to improve lives uh, by improving sight. So uh, our chairman of SILO, uh, so you know that every, everyone should have the right to good vision. Uh, 7.7 million inhabitants of this planet need vision correction and vision protection. So we will be there, of course. Then. So uh, just to, to know, uh, only uh, two, bi two billion people are wearing glasses today. Um, two point uh, five million people suffer for, from incorrect poor vision. Uh, Six point two billion people do not protect their eyes with uh, sunglasses uh, for the UV and, and blue lights. So blue light is for screen, laptop. And uh, in, uh, by uh, 2050, uh, the myopia uh, will be increased, uh, will increase significantly uh, for 4.3 billion people. 
So, um, uh, Essilor uh, covers the partition of, of lenses. We have several uh, brands like uh, Essilor, Nikon, uh, Kodak, Barrivix. Uh, we, uh, with Luxottica, we have uh, uh, several brands. Uh, you know Ribbon, I think you know Ribbon, uh, Oakley, and, and, and uh, we have more, uh, more than uh, one, uh, one, 100 uh, brands. And uh, we sell uh, equipment and instrument for uh, medical, uh, often ophthalmologist and doctor, and for for uh, optometrist and optician. And uh, we uh, we do online and retail. So yes, we we cover all all the consumer uh, since uh, kids uh, and uh, all the, the, the generation. Uh, just to focus, uh, we we have an industry that we need to create, to invent, uh, a technology industry. So we are close to uh, 450 researchers around the world. Unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have the, 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 the researchers in Africa. Uh, most, uh, most of them are in Europe uh, and uh, Asia and America. So uh, about my uh, my experience in, in Kenya, so I uh, joined Isilor since just one year. So I have just a small experience uh, in Kenya, but I want just to uh, to share with you uh, the issues that I have today to uh, industri in, to rethinking industrialization. So uh, what is the barrier on, on the ground? Uh, the, the issue for, for us, when we would like to import the good, uh, the clearance time is very long and inconsistent. It's, so it's very difficult to control uh, the supply time. Uh, and I'm very uh, surprised uh, in, in Kenya uh, compared to the, to the market of Europe. But when you, you, you will, the, the customer uh, push, uh, pushes an order, they would like to have uh, immediately the goods. Uh, they, they would not like to, to, to wait. So we need to be, to be react. So the lead time is very, very important in our industry and, and that I mentioned, especially in, in Kenya. So we need, uh, we need the, the confidence of other authorities. And, and therefore, I would like to speak about the custom because it's been my, big, my big issue in Kenya. So the custom of uh, especially uh, on, on, on the, the lead time, but, but not only on the lead time, uh, on the price announced on the invoice. Just to, to share with you an experience, when, when, when you import the good, we have a price. So because uh, we are SLO, so we manufacture lenses, frames, so we, we have a price. When the, the, the invoice uh, arrive uh, in, in the hand of, uh, of customer, they check online the price, okay, and they check my price, and they say it's not the same price, and the, the parcel uh, 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 is blocked for a long time only to explain the difference of, of the price. So yes, so that, that's why we need uh, we need to uh, confidence. Uh, <coughs> we. We, we uh, for, for the, the, the transport, uh, we have just two solutions to date, only with DHL and, and Aramex, and, and I know DHL is cover, uh, I think, 80%, and Aramex 20%. So uh, when you speak with DHL, because they cover a lot of market, they don't have just one, one, one customer, so uh, they take time to, uh, to, to take care of you. Uh, so we, we, we cannot use another transport today, uh, only two. Uh, and, 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 and knowing at what stage the, the customer official are delivering the package, we don't know. Sometimes it takes uh, 10 days, sometimes uh, 20, sometimes uh, one month. So yes, what do you need to export? Uh, we, we would like, it's very important to digitalize our system. So we have a system that we can order directly, uh, 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 directly uh, into our production system. So we, uh, obviously it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's 
it's very nice if we facilitate the exit and entry of, of goods in East Africa country, so by preventing uh, custom delays. And uh, you know, for a global company like us, uh, no matter what we come from, because we have a lot of uh, industry in the world, Dubai, Thailand, India, China, and Kenya, I, uh, I call this, uh, particularly this, uh, this country, because uh, we order from this country. So we need to be registered as a manufacturer and facilitate the access of goods into the country. But the good news, uh, uh, two months ago, especially in Kenya and, uh, and Tanzania, uh, the government decided uh, to classify our industry uh, under medical devices. So uh, we have now uh, a new process. Uh, we need a, a license uh, to import. Uh, everybody needs a license to import. So obviously we, we have a tax, <laughs> zero point, uh, uh, almost uh, think one percent. And uh, TNDA uh, in Tanzania, uh, we have a tax as well, uh, two percent. But it's good because uh, the, the market now is, is regulated. To, uh, to, to import to import the goods, uh, it's not it's it's easy to to, to register uh, online. So uh, what are the solution to to be successful uh, on my side? So the the, the solution is uh, by we to, to to create a lab here in Kenya to manufacture. Uh, that's why we, we can avoid the lead time from the, the custom. So we can uh, order semi-finished lenses and uh, we will be able to surface them uh, directly uh, in our lab and, and, and to, to have a lead time. Uh, to know our needs, we, we, we need to anticipate our orders, which means knock, knocking the demand of our market, uh, knowing uh, our customers, uh, our potential, so that's very important to, uh, to, uh, to order the, the stock of, uh, of semi-finish and, uh, and the, the frames uh, and instrument. Uh, I uh, spoke to you about uh, digitization. Uh, we need to invest massively uh, in digitization to, uh, uh, to improve uh, our services, uh, especially in solid time. Uh, but uh, we need to convince our customers that it's uh, an, an advantage. So uh, it means uh, changing habits. Uh, it's not uh, so easy uh, in, in, uh, in our industry. Uh, so now we, we have curfew. So if uh, we don't have curfew, uh, we can work uh, uh, triple shift. And uh, so we can invest uh, in the staff. And uh, yes, uh, it's also necessary to control the delivery times, uh, so between the manufacturer and the customer. So I, I, I speak about the, the, the domestic delivery solution. And uh, we don't have specifically uh, the, the way to, uh, uh, for, for our industry, so if we can have factory or yet on imported raw materials, uh, it would be good. And, and obviously, facilitate the importation of the good by creating a, a, a simple way with the, the customer, the customer officer. Uh, I like to just to have a focus on Ethiopia. Uh, the, 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 we have a lab in Ethiopia uh, uh, to, to, to surface the, the lenses, but uh, the big issue uh, is the forex problem. So uh, we need the approval of the bank. Uh, and we can wait a long, long time, sometimes one year, uh, and we can, uh, we can uh, be out of stock uh, sometimes. So, so the market is here, it's a very, really huge market, but uh, we have an issue of, of Forex. And if uh, you would like to, uh, to use an import company, uh, they currently charge us 45% uh, of the cost of the price. Lending, lending cost. So, uh, so it's very complicated uh, when you are in industry because you have uh, a low margin. Uh, so, see if you if you pass through uh, the importation company, uh, but you lose your margin. So, it's impossible uh, today. So, the solution is uh, uh, you have to be on, on very good terms with banking partners to to get an approval. <laughs> 
of the bank. Uh, and uh, yes, and, and chose at least two of them, uh, and, and chose them that we, we are fi uh, uh, financially stable and solid. Uh, so the relation with the bank is very important. Uh, but try to get dollar uh, locally, but because if you have dollar, it's not an issue. Uh, you don't need the bank's approval. So uh, uh, it's good to 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 to, to, to have dollar, but. In, in our company uh, like, like us, uh, difficult to, uh, to, to put the, 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 the dollar uh, into this country because we, we cannot uh, go, uh, go out. <laughs> uh, then uh, the solution is uh, to, to, to find a, a partner that, that have a, a dollar uh, and, uh, and obviously to anticipate as much as possible the stock and have uh, six on, uh, on one year or so. Uh, just uh, our solution in Kenya uh, is to invest uh, in the new lab uh, and we would like to, uh, to start a new lab in, in Kenya in March 2022. Uh, so just to, to show you, uh, we, 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 we found a place, uh, especially in, uh, in Kenya, uh, ABC place. Uh, 1,000 square meters to, uh, to invest in the lab and it's, it's a solution for, for us. Uh, to cover so, uh, our multi-channels, multi so uh, retail, uh, independent practices, uh, we do uh, e-commerce as well and we have some, uh, especially some uh, just uh, focused inclusive business uh, in, uh, in Kenya uh, we train a uh, lot of Kenyan to, uh, to be uh, optometrists, not optometrists, but optician of technical, and they can build uh, our uh, arm business. And we have a program uh, called Iwafiki here. Uh, we train them, and uh, we have uh, now 70 uh, small stores outside Nairobi uh, to, uh, to deliver the, the, the site for the population. So thank you for your, your attention. Uh, and if you have any question, uh, let me know. Thank you very much, Frederick. That was really interesting and, and full of information on for us. We're now going to move on to Anne and and her food flavors, which is also an extremely interesting business. Um, thank you so much, Anne. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be very brief. I just have a few notes. Um, thank you to the CDH team to, for, to invite us today for this uh, interesting conversation. So I'm uh, I am the I am Anne and Marianne. I'm the co-founder and uh, managing director of Afribon. So Afribon is uh, is a manufacturer, a local manufacturer, serving the the local food and beverage manufacturing industry. So we, uh, we locally design and manufacture test solutions for, for our customers. Uh, so we have presence in uh, six countries and production sites in every country. Um, so uh, we are talking about uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Cameroon and Nigeria. So. Um, we don't reinvent uh, nothing, we just bring locally uh, a product and associated services that uh, our clients usually have to get from outside. Um, so we, we're quite, uh, I mean we're still very small, uh, Afriban is uh, just below 5 million euro turnover. Um, but we are, we are fast growing, I can say. Um, so yes, I, I guess today I represent uh, SMEs. Um, which of course is, is, uh, is very, is, has a key role to play, right, in the uh, industrialization of, uh, of Africa. Um, so the, the reason why um, we've become a, a local leader in our industry uh, is, um, so first, I could say a good understanding of uh, local consumer preferences, uh, also uh, local regulatory understanding. So, you know, every country has different bureau of standards, issuing different standards for 
food and beverages, so of course one needs to, to know. Uh, but more than this, um, the reason uh, why we, we, we made it here is um, because thanks to our, it's, it's because of our rapid product development and delivery and the lower uh, minimum order quantities that we offer to our customers. Uh, so, of course, we, it's reduced lead times for our customers and we also help them to reduce uh, their inventory. Uh, so, it's, uh, it's uh, essentially uh, I mean a good help for, for manufacturers here. Uh, we, we, we sell, we, 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 we sometimes say that we, what we sell is actually peace of mind uh, for our clients, uh, which, which is a very rare product uh, here. <laughs> so, I think um, this is one of the, uh, of the, of the, I mean, the main challenge for our customers is um, to get their inputs uh, at a reasonable cost and within a reasonable time. So this is one of, the, of, of, the, of their challenges. Uh, Frederick, you have mentioned many others. Um, and as I'm sure we mentioned other challenges uh, today. Uh, but if I, if, I want, if I look at the, the positive side, um, this dynamic that has been really beneficial to, to us is uh, the, the regional and the continental integration that has started. Uh, so I'm talking about EAC and COMESA. So um, what it means uh, for us uh, is, is um, like um, for the for the past in in the recent years we've we've, st we've started supplying uh, accessing new new markets from uh, from here from Nairobi. Um, so from here we supply customers in uh, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, Zimbabwe, Zambia. Uh, Malawi. So, uh, concretely, uh, what we do is we, we get uh, EAC or Comesa certificate uh, for, uh, from the bodies here, uh, and then uh, it uh, enables us to transport and to sell our goods uh, with our duties in these countries. So, it's, uh, it's it's definitely not perfect. Uh, there, there's still a lot of resistance here and there. Um, some roads are still very complicated, like Kenya, Tanzania is a, is a nightmare. Uh, but um, it, it's happening, and uh, for us, it, it's been really uh, key, um, really enabled, uh, enabling us to, to reach a, a new scale. And I believe for, it's the same for the yeah, the, or the rest of the industry. Um, you mentioned China, how China has uh, made it uh, with industrialization and uh, of course the scale that they have. Individual African countries can't, can't have it. Uh, so I think it's really a, a really great hope and uh, I, really, I really think, uh, I have felt the, the progress and I think there's, uh, there's still a lot to, to come on this side. Um, yes, I, uh, let me stop here and after we can engage more with the next time. Okay, Nicola. Nicola. Thank you. Hello, good morning. So we stay here because then I can see everybody, <laughs> it's probably easier. Uh, so um, I'm very pleased to, to be with you this morning. I'm Nicolas Gibert, uh, the CEO of Mobius Motors. Um, and I would like to tell you a few words about, um, about Mobius Motors' adventure, because it's really an adventure. So Mobius Motors was founded by Joel Jackson, uh, a British guy, 10 years ago. He came to Kenya to work for an NGO, and uh, he, he realized that, in fact, this market, as, as many, by the way, many European people realize when they come to Africa that the African automotive market is very special in the sense that uh, the, um, it's made of, 90% of the market is made of imported second-hand cars, and this is very unique on the planet, I would say. There are very few uh, regions in the world like that. 
And so he, he realized that these vehicles were imported, seven years old, uh, 70,000 kilometers to 100,000 kilometers, not really matching the customer needs as well. Uh, and so he, uh, he didn't understand that and he uh, had a vision. And the vision is very simple, is to turn around this market into a locally made new cars market in which you can really buy a car with zero kilometer, zero mileage, and then a warranty and, and a car as well, if possible, which is designed uh, for for the for the African market, which is, which is a bit special. In fact, it's a, it's an evolving market because of the evolving infrastructure. Uh, but you must have a very versatile car, able to uh, be driven on any kind of road. So he he had this vision, and in fact, and this is where I want to go, is that uh, in fact the essence of Obus Motors is is local manufacturing because the only way to uh, to accomplish this this vision is to uh, is to is to locally make the car, and um, I want to point out here something very important, uh, and this is because there are um, uh, tariffs, so uh, barriers to to importation that are very clever, very smart. This is very good. I think there is a good uh, framework here in, uh, in in Kenya, but also in, in in many countries of Africa as well. So there is a tariff. So this protects normally the market. The only problem is at the end. So despite there is a tariff that should normally encourage, incentive OEMs to come and, and, and assemble or make locally cars, it's not what's happening. And it's not what's happening uh, just because, um, uh, in fact, the, there is no barrier, there is no, uh, it is, in fact, it is possible to import a used car. It's not forbidden. In many markets, it's not possible to import a used car. So if you want to really develop a local industry, which doesn't exist at all, uh, you have to first implement uh, tariff barriers, okay? But you must do that uh, such a way you won't have uh, another possibility, in fact, to go around this, this barrier and to, and to finally uh, import another product uh, uh, going around this, uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, this barrier. So, uh, and so definitely in the automotive industry in, uh, in Kenya and Africa, and this is a, a very key point of all the discussions we have among the OEMs or the people who want to locally uh, develop the kind of industry uh, is to, um, uh, in fact, forbid the import of a used car. And some countries have done that already, in the north of Africa particularly. Uh, Kenya uh, limited uh, the, the, the age of the imported cars to eight years. Tanzania is 15 years. Uh, so this is definitely a challenge uh, which is debated uh, in the um, AFTA uh, organization, of course. Uh, everybody knows that it is something that, that must evolve, must change, uh, if you want to, uh, to create the, uh, the right environment to develop this industry. So ju just to go back in a few words about to, to, to Mobius, um, so 10 years ago, Joel Jackson de decided, in fact, to, to develop and to make a car in Kenya uh, that would be competitive against imported used cars. So com when I say competitive, means price first, because uh, the, 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 the Kenyan customer and the African customer is very sensitive to the price, and it's normal. And he developed the first car, which is a Mobius II first generation that was produced um, in, uh, in KVM um, five years ago, 50 cars. And uh, Mobius faced, in fact, the, the first challenge obvious one is, uh, I was not in the company at that time, I joined the company two years ago, um, but this car was produced for a price of $30,000 and was sold at $10,000. So you can understand it's difficult to go into a mass production in this condition. So, uh, but it was in fact a proof of concept, it was a way to start. And I don't know if you probably many of you already saw this car on the on the road, it's an iconic car already. It's it, made us launch the brand, make, make of Mobius a brand, uh, of which people are very proud of, and this is, this is very good. So the company decided to stop this production and to start the development of the Mobius II second generation, uh, from which we delivered the, the, the first car in, in July uh, this year to the first customer. And this car uh, has a much lower production cost um, and a bit higher uh, selling price, uh, so it's it's sell it's sold at 1.5 million, okay, and the production cost is 
close to this uh, to, to this uh, to this number. And this is the the second point I wanted to uh, to stress as well uh, this morning is that it's very difficult when you uh, I mean people when when they look at us uh, OEMs they just they just uh, ignore us, or they say they're crazy guys that are doing stupid things because they try to launch a new, to start up a new, a new OEM. Uh, and, and you know that big OEMs, they make 10 million cars a year. Uh, so when you have so long series of cars, you can achieve extremely uh, competitive prices. So our challenge for us is how can we, how can we start an, a new OEM, an African OEM, uh, from scratch? So the good thing, the right thing to do is, so first we have to develop, we have to design the car, to design it with um, uh, concepts that are uh, possible to produce efficiently, I would say uh, at an acceptable price uh, f with a low volume. And a very low volume because our car, the Mobius 2 second generation, we plan, we aim to produce 2,000 cars a year. So we are very far from the, the 300,000 cars a year of, of some, uh, some, some lines. Um, so for that, and also the other thing is we also don't have so much money. To launch a car, an OEM, when they launch a car, they spend a, a billion dollars or more. Okay, in JLR, to, when JLR launches a car, it's, it's, it's 1.3 billion pounds, not dollars. Okay, so it's, it's something very expensive. Uh, we have developed our Mobius 2 for $5 billion. Okay, so how did we do that? With a design that, uh, that allows using a tooling, which is very simple and at a very low cost, okay? We also uh, looked uh, among the, the, the supply chain on the planet at existing solutions as well, for which there is no investment to do at all. So half of our car is uh, off the shelf parts, and half of it are bespoke parts, so parts designed for our vehicle. Uh, so you have to really think uh, smartly and find solutions that, that make you able to, uh, to, um, yes, to, to produce this car at a price which is not too high, but also with an investment which is very low, okay? And I'm saying that because in fact, um, and I think this is a challenge for, for, for Africa in developing uh, its industry, is when you start from scratch, uh, you, I mean, you are very weak. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you have, uh, you don't have all the benefit that the others have with already long series of production. So uh, you have to, to do that smartly and then step by step, step by step, when, once the volume starts growing, then you can go to other technologies, other solutions that are more efficient. Uh, and and this, is our, this is our plan. So we started with a proof of concept that was extremely expensive, second generation, which is uh, a significantly lower price, okay, and a better car with uh, more comfort, with more features. So this is, in fact, a real productivity we've done, okay. Uh, but we know that it's not enough, and we'll have to, in the next step, uh, develop more efficient solutions. And where I want to go is when when you when you see how t how difficult is it it is sorry. Um, you you need some help, okay? So it's clear that if Africa, if the if the continent and if the countries want to really develop their industry, and I take the, the example of the car industry, which is very capitalistic, particularly, and and risky because the cycles are very long. When you launch a car, it takes five to seven years. Okay, so it's a long cycle. Uh, you need to help this industry. I don't know any car industry uh, or any region of the world who develop its car industry without protecting the car industry first at the beginning and also supporting it, helping. And this is the job of a government. So when we say that the government has to develop infrastructures, like roads, like telecommunications, all of that is key, of course, but they have also to think the industry as being part of the infrastructure. When, when, you, when you develop, so, so the car industry is key. I don't know any uh, industrialized region that doesn't have any car industry. USA, Europe, uh, uh, Asia, uh, Japan started with that, Korea, China, uh, and it took 
to every region. So I, I put apart Europe and, and USA because this is the historical development. But if you look at emerging countries who decided to develop that kind of industry, they decided it. It was not only a private initiative, it was a combination of a private initiative and uh, a strategic decision of a government. Um, when they uh, decided it, it took more or less 40 years, 40 years to each region to develop it. You could observe that in Japan, the cell in, Co in Korea, in China, China decided to start, uh, started that in the early 80s, and they are now, just now, starting to export, really, I mean, uh, significantly, because they started already 10 years ago, but it was just trials. Uh, so, so in fact, uh, and, and this is what Mobius is, uh, what with the message we are trying to, to, to send to, uh, to the government, to uh, uh, the, the cross-governmental authorities, is, guys, if you want to develop your car industry, uh, you have to, um, not only celebrate a private initiative like Mobius Motors, it's a private initiative, okay? The funds, by the way, are coming from uh, uh, other regions than Africa, so it's a private initiative that has been funded by, uh, by America, by Europe, uh, a little bit as well from Kenya, which is good, excellent, but don't, don't only celebrate. Uh, take it as an opportunity for the country because it's an opportunity, that will, there won't be so many like that. The last one was in the, in the 90s and they didn't produce any car finally, only one. Okay, so take this as an opportunity to grow your car industry or to try to grow it. But for that, you, you have to think not only uh, one year or two years, you have to think 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, because Mobius uh, will become a big OEM in Africa only within 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, once we've gone through different steps, okay? And we have very nice projects in mind, <laughs> so. Okay, so this is what I wanted to start with. Um, so we've launched Mobius um, 2 first generation five years ago. We've just launched Mobius 2 second generation in July. And in August, we decided as well to launch another car, the Mobius 3. Uh, and this is also uh, a step as well, a strategic or tactical, let's say, a tactical decision in our strategic vision. So Mobius 2 is a car which is fully designed in Kenya. Uh, we have in the company a team of 10 engineers who are working every day on the Dassault Katia system, which is used by all the OEMs, by uh, all the aerospace industry as well. Uh, we have that here in Kenya, people who work on this system and design the Mobius 2. Uh, we have a local content which is 25% of the view of the car, it's unique. We are the only one, uh, apart from South Africa, of course, uh, who can achieve this kind of level of content. We can go up to 50% without any problem because we have a simple technology. So we know already the parts we are going to localize from India to Kenya when we grow the production. Uh, so, we, uh, so, so, so this is in fact the, the core vision of Mobius Motors, to design and to, to manufacture a car locally. But uh, we had two challenges. The first one uh, is to um, grow the brand. So for that, we needed another car. So we prospected, among other OEMs, if there was any platform we could, we could, uh, we could share and in order to put on the market another car that is aligned with our DNA. So we found one in Asia, uh, and we, uh, we, we worked with the OEM. And they agreed, in fact, to, to see just the license. So we have the license, and we, can, we, can, we could rebrand this car uh, a Mobius. So this is a Mobius 3. So Mobius 3 is a CKD. It's assembled in Kenya. Uh, it's not designed in Kenya. The, level, the local content is not very high, but we assemble it anyway. And we anyway created a job also to, uh, to assemble it locally, which is good. It's the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, tariff. Uh, and, and thanks to that, we can have two cars, one that covers the um, the largest UV segment, Mobius 3, and the second one, so Mobius 2, that covers the uh, small SUV, SUV segment. And, and this Mobius 3, which is a fantastic car uh, that was launched in August this year, you can buy it for the small price of 4 million if you want, you are welcome, <laughs> Kenyan shilling, but brand new car, 3 years warranty, which is uh, 
uh, I mean, even less expensive than imported used cars for the for the same price. Uh, and and thanks to that, we can now grow our brand and support uh, our core vision, uh, which is to design and, and and manufacture locally cars for not only Kenya but East Africa and in the future, of course, the whole Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. That's um, that's so great, Nicholas. When when can we see the cars? Uh, so you can see them now, okay. no problem. <laughs> and if you want great. to have a, to have a drive test, you come to me. I take your business card. And I can organize a drive test of the, of the Wave Three for you. No problem. We are welcome. That's great. Actually, Jack Hall was talking about it before he goes back to South Africa. I'm sure he wants to um, experience that driving. Experience. You are welcome. Thank you so much, um, Frederick, uh, Anne, and Nicholas. All of this um, experience is extremely valuable. Um, these are pieces of information we wouldn't have before. But what I want us to do now is to turn over to our lawyers who can then give us some practical advice about the challenges that we're currently facing and then how can we overcome those challenges um, in these times and then also looking to the future with the um, free trade agreement that um, Jack Wall talked to, to us about. So focusing on the challenges that Frederick and Nicholas has spoken about, and then what can we do um, looking to the future? Thank, thank you, Desmond. Um, so I've just made a few notes. So when we talk about, so uh, Frederick has mentioned various trade facilitation issues um, that SLR is experiencing, whether it's in Kenya, whether it's in Ethiopia, either in terms of tra transfer funds, which is critical um, because any company, manufacturer, investor, you have to have ease of transfer funds or the cost associated to a product because if you manufacture a product on the continent, whether it's in Kenya, in Ethiopia, wherever, it's all about being cost competitive with the rel relative other markets. So, um, and it's important as part of the AFCFT process, but also um, as Nicholas has mentioned, so governments need to be proactive in essentially driving the process in creating regulations, industrial policies, not just from a, from a Kenyan perspective or Ethiopian or Tanzanian perspective, but you need to look at the entire region and say, how do we as a region add value? So you can have Kenya as the hub, uh, in respect of, say, it's the automotive industry. Um, you have various other jurisdictions within East Africa contributing from, an, from a parts perspective to the auto manufacturing industry. So it's ensuring that there's industrial policies, not just in one country, but in all the countries that are aligned, because it doesn't help one country just going on a certain path, but there's a collective vision to ensure that we need to have economic growth. And economic growth and regional value addition can only happen to, through the region and the continent working together. So I think that's important. And that's also how we will achieve the cost effective and competitiveness um, in relative to other markets like China. Um, there is a big market to tap in, as you've also recognized in, in what Anne has mentioned. So as a SMME, I think if you look at the AFCFT, it's actually built to ensure that SMMEs can access the market easily in terms of either certificates of origin, making trade facilitation easy. So if I am a, a small business in Kenya manufacturing um, bags and I want to export that to someone sitting in Cape Town, it should be very easy for me to essentially, the person places the order on the internet through the internet, places the order, that product arrives in Cape Town the following day. Without customs, so there's the other checks of that needs to be done, but with a ease process where you don't have to pay additional taxes or customs or duties, have to deal with numerous paperwork to get a simple bag to uh, Cape Town, or a few banks. So, and that's fundamental. So it's SMMEs, making it easier, and also looking at bigger industries, developing regional value chains like Mobis, um, ensuring that you actually have African businesses, African manufacturing uh, multinationals that are developed 
on the continent, first serving the continent before we look outside. Because again, not to re-emphasize, there is a market of, yes, 1.3 billion people in terms of developmental status. When there's more investment in various businesses where there is more people employed, you have, there's, a, there's a catapult effect of putting people in the middle class. You can then afford a, a Modus 3 as opposed to just an entry-level vehicle. So that is what we're looking for. And I think that's the, the, the role the industry uh, and the issues the industry has identified, saying um, critically from my side, I would say ter so, so it's a collective effort between the industry and government, but government critically so has to play a major part because without government, as Nicholas has also mentioned, you need to have industrial policies driven by government. Then you, otherwise you won't industrialize. You need government to be the be the champion for industrialization. Not just talk about it, but do it. Um, and not just about one country, but all the countries collectively in a region identifying this is our competitive advantage, and this is how we're going to ensure th all the regions in Africa have a different role to play, and all of us can collectively actually contribute to the success of the entire continent. So that's a few words. So thank you. I think that's very helpful, Jacqueline. Um And I think it, it touches on everything that um, Frederick, Anne, and Nicholas have talked about. Um, let's talk about what, what could we can do now in terms of remedies, in terms of where can, where can we go to? How can we address some of the, the pain points that they've identified? Um, the other point I just wanted to make is we also need to stress uh, where we are on the uh, free trade agreement so that we can be sure of its implementation stage and everyone can know, um, you know how far we've progressed with that. Okay. <laughs> um, in, in terms of, um, so where we are, let me start with where we are currently. Um, so from a, from a trade agreement perspective, um, so most of you might have read, so from the 1st of January this year, trade effectively started amongst African member states under the AFCFTA uh, um, agreement. And there's not just the, there's an overarching agreement and there's protocol. So there's a protocol on goods, there's a protocol on service, there's a protocol on dispute settlement. So if uh, Desmond can, will speak about the dispute settlement. And each of these have various instrument, in, um, underlying instruments. One of those which is critical for manufacturers is the rules of origin. So what is rules of origin? It means where does the product originate from? And what is, what is the composition in terms of assembly that would would deem that product as, we would say, African, made in Africa. So rules of origin still being negotiated. I think they're 80% there. Hopefully they'll conclude by the end of this year, the beginning of next year. There's still also discussions on tra tariffs. Um, I think that's also significantly progressed. Um, and a number of other uh, protocols in relation to trade facilitation. But mostly um, systems have been put in place to ensure that uh, parties can start accessing the benefits under the AFCFTA. But on a practical level, it will probably still take, I would think, another few years for us to really see integration in terms of systems. When I export, again, a product from Kenya into the DRC in terms of ease of facilitation of that process from one border, so I stop at, I go from Kenya, to Rwanda, to the DRC. So each checkpoint, d there needs to be ease of the transport of the goods. So, so that is still work in progress. There's also, there's a lot of cri crit criticisms towards the AFCFTA also in terms of the view that some people express is that it has been rushed. The view of the African Union and the Secretariat and most of the African governments is it's not been rushed. Um, we need to start somewhere and we need to start implementing it. And the only way to implement it is to <coughs> run with it. Um, technically, there's probably only three or four countries on the continent that has all systems in place. And I think that's Egypt, South Africa, Ghana, and Kenya, Almost. <laughs> so, uh, but I think all of those will hopefully be resolved by next year. Thank you very much.
Um, just before Desmond uh, um, starts and gives us uh, advice on dispute resolution, um, I want to call over my colleague, Shem, who will talk to us specifically about why it is that we are focusing as CDH on this sector and what we see as a potential. Um, so Shem, just line up so that we can, <laughs> because I'm, re I'm realizing that we're um, slightly over time. Um, and so thanks, Desmond. Africa Free uh, Continental Trade Agreement, they have, uh, you know, come up with a, a dispute resolution protocol because they they realize that uh, to be able to have, um, you know, predictability and certainty as to how uh, this agreement is being implemented across the, the, the various countries, you need to have a mechanism where if there's a dispute between any of the state parties, so for instance, if uh, in, in Kenya the manufacturers complain that, uh, you know, in Ethiopia we still have, you know, non-tariff barriers that is preventing us from accessing that market. So this dispute resolution protocol is really to, to enable um, the, the parties have a way of, of, of bringing their complaints to the foreground and having a way of resolving it. So under the dispute resolution protocol, there's a dispute resolution body. And in that dispute resolution body, the, the, the first point of call is actually a consultation. Um, and maybe before I even get to consultation, um, to be able to lodge a complaint, uh, a private party can, cannot lodge a complaint by itself to this body. It has to go through its host state. So if, for example, Mobius has a complaint or the car uh, manufacturing sector in Kenya has a complaint, it has to go through the Kenya government and, and lodge its complaint. And then the Kenya government then now uh, goes to the dispute resolution body and now says that uh, our car manufacturers have a complaint against Ethiopia because they are not complying you know, with with the with the trade agreement, they are not. They have not eliminated their tariffs or or their non-tariff barriers. So, so that is how it is envisioned. And uh, I think I think the reason for this is um, I think because it's also firstly a political process. Um, so it is really for the the state parties to be able to have consultations with the other state party. Uh, to be able to tell them you need you know to comply with 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 the trade agreement you need to do xyz so that we can achieve you know that the 2063 vision um that that we have for the continent so consultation is the first port of call if consultation does not work then the dispute um uh, settlement body can now actually have a hearing so it's, it's similar to what you'd have in a court of law so they would pick, uh, you know, um, um, uh, representatives from different member states to hear the dispute, and the decision that they come up with will be binding on 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 all the state parties or on the disputing state parties, and uh, that decision that they may give one it could be uh, informing the you know the guilty state party to 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 comply. Uh, you know, with the, with the trade agreement. Um, over and above that, it may even include uh, an order for compensation. Um, and uh, over and above that, it could also be, for instance, that the aggrieved state party, you know, uh, sort of waives some of the concessions it has already given. So it has been designed so that it can have teeth that can bite. Uh, and that is the only way that it would be uh, a success. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, um, uh, Desmond. Thank you, Jack. Well, thank you to our panelists as well for taking the time to be with us. Let me hand over to Shem. Thank you, Anjeri, for leading that um, very um, vibrant and insightful discussion. Um, so I just want to give you a brief um, background or insight into Cliff Decker Hoffmeyer and where we fit in into this entire narrative regarding um, industrials, manufacturing, and trade. Um, Jack will set the background with Agenda 63 and um, Agenda 2063, um, sorry, and the, the level of ambition that has been demonstrated by the AU 
um, in, in, in respect of this agenda is, if you've had the chance to look at it, you know, um, quite high, to say the very least. Um, it's got 15 pillars, um, you know, envisioning a high-speed um, rail network connecting all African um, capitals. Um, it envisions a dam that produces 40,000 megawatts and supplies clean, um, cheap electricity um, to, to, to Africans across the continent, um, to manufacturers, to sort of spur on um, um, uh, growth in that industry while reducing production costs. I mean, it's got um, the African passport um, that allows free movement um, and uh, capacity to work for African citizens across the continent. Labor being a key factor in production would be of interest to manufacturers. And, and of course, the AFCFTA, um, which um, creates a, a free trade area across the continent. I could go on and on, there's 15 pillars, but they're all very ambitious. I mean, if you look at them, you might wonder, is this just a paper that's meant to make us feel good about ourselves as Africans? Or is it something that we tangibly, truly, honestly believe we will realize within our lifetimes? A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And realizing the AFC, uh, FTA, it is just the beginning. The other steps, I believe very much so I'm a Pan-Africanist myself, will follow in due course, hopefully sooner rather than later. And we as CDH want to be part of the regionalization narrative. And the setting up of an Nairobi office for CDH fits in perfectly into that narrative. We want to partner with clients within the industrial manufacturing and trade sector to, to regionalize their operations, to take advantage of not just the national markets, but markets that lie beyond their borders within Africa. And we believe that as CDH, um, with, with a Pan-African Pan vision, with now a new, um, new footprint within Kenya, and, and local um, uh, best friend council advice and support within various jurisdictions in Africa, we are well positioned to assist our clients within this sector to become part of the regionalization narrative um, that is sweeping the continent. Um, just a few thoughts um, about our, our industrial uh, manufacturing and trade sector. It is um, complementary to other sectors within our firm, the oil and gas sector. Um, I've seen um, representatives from Total here. Mining and minerals, energy and power are the three sectors that um, our IMT sector is most closely um, um, affiliated with. So we do not operate within a vacuum. And there is a close synergy uh, between our professionals across these sectors. Um, we're ably led by Mr. Jackwell Ferris, um, who's been kind enough to join us from Johannesburg. A true testament to the value and importance that he places um, on the regionalization narrative. Um, traveling during COVID times, indeed, um, could, be, could offer no further proof, I guess, of, of his commitment. Um, we are uh, within, uh, we are located currently within four um, locations, three of them in South Africa, um, Stellenbosch, Cape Town, and Joburg, and Nairobi being the first uh, venture outside of Africa, but the first of many to come. Um, I'm confident, very, very confident of that fact. Um, the IMT uh, sector within our firm um, and, the, and the specialists that we have um, support a lot of traditional industries, um, the most major ones being the petrochemicals, um, manufacturing industry, uh, mineral uh, beneficiation or, or value addition, and uh, uh, the automobile industry, primarily in, in South Africa, but um, we are grateful to have Nicholas in our midst. We're very proud of Mobius as being a local uh, manufacturer and encouraged to hear of, of the progress that they have made. Um, absolutely, so those are the traditional um, manufacturing sectors that we would support, but of course, uh, we're looking also at um, emerging industries. Um, you know, robotics and automation are becoming um, uh, a big deal in, in the manufacturing sector. Um, as people look to, to make their production operations more efficient, um, as they look to reduce costs. Um, hydrogen um, is becoming an, uh, an alternative fuel source, three times more energy levels than your normal gasoline. Um, and also um, 
providing a lot of input of, of, of feeding other industries as well, such as fertilizers and agriculture, um, and how that affects agriculture. And you know, electric vehicles, um, hopefully, I'm not quite sure, perhaps I'll side chat uh, Nicholas about that. Could I get an electric Mobius in, in the not too distant future? <laughs> he will be silent at this moment. But all those exciting emerging industries which we as CDH are positioning ourselves and indeed beginning to make forays into, uh, and so are well placed to, to support in, in that capacity. And we do support the full suit, we do offer the full suit of legal services um, throughout the life cycle of business businesses and investments. We look at transaction structuring, and we look at uh, corporate structuring as well. And Jerry would tell you uh, more about that, or would talk about that better than I ever could. Um, risk mitigation and optimization of some of the benefits and um, trade incentives under the AFC, um, CFTA um, is an area of advice that we uh, also offer. So basically bringing to life the frameworks that would otherwise be theoretical and nice to hear about, but not really beneficial to anyone. Um, we have advisory services in the competition space. Again, Sami, our managing partner, and Jerry um, could talk all day about competition law. And that too has a regional complexion. Um, as, as we have commercial regulatory frameworks, um, uh, as well as national frameworks, we have an East African framework as well. Um, and we do assist also in regulatory compliance um, and, 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 um, and assessment as well. Product liability, employment law, labor, I've, I've mentioned that as being a very key area for manufacturers. Um, you really do not have a manufacturing enterprise without the skill set um, necessary. And, and labor, labor law um, is another one of our service lines. Um, dispute resolution. Um, Jacquel and, and Desmond are very active in that space as well, and I do come in uh, in respect of intellectual property and anti-counterfeiting innovation. Um, always, always has been a key aspect of uh, manufacturing. And so your whole patent advisory, branding and trademark rights, anti-counterfeiting is a service line that our firm has proper capacity for. So in essence, we are thrilled to partner with the French Chamber of Commerce. We consider the French Chamber of Commerce a true friend, let alone partner, uh, to Cliff Decker Hoffmeyer. We have been um, in close talks. We have been in close collaboration and partnership. We have met many of you um, at many uh, events prior to this one. This will certainly not be the last. Um, we will definitely always keep you close and loop you in to all that we are doing. And so we are thrilled to have you join us this morning. Jerry, please take over. You know, um, every time um, I'm, I'm with my partners, um, Sami, Shem, uh, Desmond, um, and now Jacqueline, I'm so proud. Honestly, I'm so proud of, of what we've achieved in the few short months that we've been in existence. And I'm so happy to be with you guys. So thank you so much for making the time. And thank you very much for your insights. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, because because we don't want to just um, we don't want to just do the work. We really want to partner with our clients. We really want to assist, uh, and that's why it was important for us to have panelists who are doing the work, and then we can give you the advice because we can only support you um, in in everything that you're doing. And we really want to be your partner in business. Um, and so, any questions that you have whether they're related to this or not, you know, feel free to contact us. I'm sure you have your, our contact details in the pack that you've received. Um, I just want to say to you, to, to the audience, thank you so much for making the time to come at so early in the morning. And I hope that you can stay later and have um, some breakfast if you haven't had a chance to, or a coffee, uh, or even a, dis a discussion with one of us. Thank you so much for making the time. We are very grateful.